Welcome to Pierce Sequel Mile, David here, and I'm so excited to bring you my Halide Mark II tutorial. This is my first proper tutorial or user guide, and I'm going to take you through all of the functionality and features in Halide Mark II. And my goal is to help you create the exact photos you want and the best photos that you possibly can. It's just you and me, so get your phone out, get Halide opened, and let's explore it together. First of all, this is a very long and detailed video, and a lot of it might not apply to you. You might not need to know how to change the white balance, for example, so feel free to use the timestamps to skip around, like a little bunny. <laughs> Second of all, this tutorial had absolutely zero input whatsoever from the developers. It's 100% my own work, all opinions are my own. So if I've got anything wrong or I've left anything out or Halide changes in some significant way that makes part of this tutorial redundant, I'll leave an update in the description as soon as I'm aware of anything. I'm also thinking of putting this tutorial into a PDF form so people can download it to their devices. And if that's something that you're interested in, then let me know. So let's get started by setting up Halide Mark II and customizing it to your workflow. When you first open the app, you're treated to a quick start guide that you can either read or skip. And if you want to see this guide again later on, you can find it in the settings under support. Next, it'll ask you for the usual camera app permissions. So tick those and give it access to all photos. Don't worry, this is perfectly normal. And Halide doesn't save, share or upload any of your photos or information. Now location is already ticked and you can't untick it, which for me is fine. I'm happy to have location turned on so I can organize and find my photos based on where they were taken. But if you don't want Halide to use your location, then you can turn it off later. And with that, welcome to Halide Mark II. A lot of Halide's functionality stays out of the way until you need it. And most of it lives down here in the quick bar, which you can access by swiping up from anywhere around here. The quick bar houses your flash, image format, timer, white balance, settings, selfie camera switcher, grid and levels and exposure guides. To arrange them how you'd like, simply tap and hold on an icon to enter the fun jiggle mode and drag the icons around. Now bear in mind, this top row of icons will always be visible even when the quick bar is closed. So it's a good idea to put functions here that you think you'll use most often. And of course, you can always rearrange them later. You can also access jiggle mode by going into the settings and choosing customize. So with the quick bar all set up, I'm ready to choose my image format that I'm going to be shooting in and Halide offers a few different options. There's RAW, which is of course in the DNG format. DNG, by the way, stands for digital negative. You can have a RAW file plus a full quality processed image, a RAW file plus a lesser quality processed image, a full quality processed image by itself, a lesser quality processed image, a depth mode processed image and a TIFF. Here, the term processed image refers to either a HEIC, which I'm going to pronounce as hike, or a JPEG. To choose your preferred image format, open the quick bar, tap the gear icon to enter the settings and tap capture. Hopefully Halide has a small description of what each one does and the different format options really do make a difference to not only the quality of your images, but to the speed they're captured as well. So if you're like me and you just want to take a raw file and nothing else, just select raw. Now when I leave the settings by tapping here, I can tap to switch between a raw file and a processed image. Very simple. Just keep in mind that until Apple Pro RAW arrives, you won't be able to shoot in RAW on any wide angle lenses. And if you're from the future and Apple Pro RAW has already arrived, then you can just ignore me. With processed images, this is the key setting as this smart processing really makes a difference to image quality. And of course, which smart processing your iPhone has exactly depends on which model you have. Halide mentions disable for faster captures, and this is absolutely true. The capture time is noticeably faster when smart processing is disabled. But if you ask me, it's not worth losing a lot of quality in exchange for capture speed. 
So choose which type of processed files you'd like, a hike or a JPEG, go back, go to advanced, then choose between high efficiency, which is hike, and most compatible, which is JPEG. When it comes to choosing which is right for you exactly, a hike or a JPEG, out of Halide, I personally can't see any difference in quality and the file sizes are about the same. So either should be great. If you decide you want a beautiful RAW file with a processed image, turn on RAW Plus and Halide has an extra treat for you called coverage. You see, in camera apps, when you take a RAW plus a processed image simultaneously, the quality of the processed image is reduced for speed reasons. But Halide sacrifices speed and lets you take a RAW file together with a full quality, key phrase, full quality JPEG with coverage. And yes, coverage is noticeably slower, but it can make a huge difference, especially in low light and in situations with a large exposure range. Just look at the difference in quality between these photos. It's not even close. And to remind you coverage is on, the former icon becomes multi-layered, which is a nice touch. But if you don't want the highest quality possible, then you can of course just turn coverage off and get a raw file with a lesser quality processed image. But again, you may as well get the best quality your phone can produce, especially if you take your photography seriously and you're going to be editing and sharing your images. This option below allows you to choose a TIFF file when in Halide's Max format. The max format refers to times when you have RAW turned on, but the iPhone is unable to shoot in RAW, like when using the ultra-wide camera or taking a selfie. And they are not wrong, these TIFF files are massive, but despite being so much larger, I can't find any discernible difference between the TIFF and the hike in max mode, so I personally leave this off. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you don't want your location saving, then you can turn this off. You can also go back into advanced and make sure this is turned off as well. And you can check your location isn't being used by keeping an eye on this little arrow up here. If it's there, then your location is being used. If it's not, then it's not. And with this Facebook spying setting, if you want location data in your photos, but you don't want it included when you upload to any Facebook owned app, including Facebook, Instagram or WhatsApp, then this option is for you. Next, I want to talk about iOS because in terms of personalizing Halide to your workflow, iOS offers some great time savers. The first one is simply tapping and holding on the Halide icon. When you do that, these options pop up that allow you to jump straight into a specific function. The next iOS time saver is Siri shortcuts. Now don't worry, you don't have to walk around talking to your phone in front of everyone while you're shooting. You can simply make the Siri shortcut and then add the icon to your home screen so you can just tap it and launch Halide into a specific function. I personally like to use Halide in manual mode, so I'm going to set up a shortcut that's going to allow me to launch Halide straight into manual mode. So in the capture settings, I'm going to tap set up Siri choose the shortcut I want and assign a command. This is what you'll say to Siri if you actually want to speak to your phone. So I'll type manual mode. Next, I'm going to open the Siri shortcuts app, find the shortcut I just made and tap the ellipses. I'm going to tap the ellipses again and tap add to home screen. I can then tap the icon and assign a different one. I have the original Halide logo saved back from when I reviewed it, so I'm going to use that, but you can literally use any photo you want. Then you can rename it for your home screen if you like, but if not, just tap add, done, done, and then check your home screen. This next iOS time saver works on my iPhone XR and my iPhone 12 Pro, but not on my first generation iPhone SE. So depending on which iPhone you have, this one may or may not work for you. Go into the settings, accessibility, touch, and back tap. Here, your iPhone can do certain things when you double or triple tap the back of the phone. And one of the things it can do is run Siri shortcuts. So I can select triple tap, then scroll down and select my manual mode shortcut. Now I can launch Halide from wherever I am in the phone and I found it's the most responsive if you tap above the Apple logo. If 
Finally, you can take pictures with Halide from your Apple Watch. This is an Apple Watch Series 3, by the way. But at the time of recording, this functionality doesn't seem to be working, so unfortunately, I can't demonstrate it for you. So with Halide set up exactly how I want it, I'm ready to start taking photos. So let's go through the picture taking process, starting with composition. As I mentioned before, Halide Mark II has a rule of thirds grid and levels built in to help you compose your shots. To access them, just tap this icon here. The icon will turn yellow to let you know it's active. The grid will remain static and the center rectangle will rotate corresponding with your phone's axis. When the phone is perfectly upright, the grid will turn yellow and depending on your device, you'll get some subtle haptic feedback. If you're shooting in landscape, once you rotate the phone past a certain point, the entire user interface will rotate to let you know you've changed the orientation of the camera and the level will turn yellow when your device is perfectly horizontal instead. If the interface doesn't change when you rotate the phone, open Control Center and ensure you don't have portrait orientation lock switched on. Now, the level only works on two axes. It doesn't respond when you tilt the phone forwards and backwards. But once you tilt past a certain point, a new circular level appears to help you position your phone perfectly flat, which I used when creating this image on my iPhone SE. You can't pinch to zoom in Halide, but iPhones with multiple lenses will give you extra compositional options, and you can access them by tapping here to cycle through the lenses you have available. You can also tap and hold, then swipe over to the lens you want to switch to, and it's really cool how you get these zoom guides as well, if you're using an iPhone with a single lens, then there won't be anything here, but you can tap here to switch between the front and back cameras. Now let's move on to focusing. Halide Mark II has both auto and manual focus. To activate the autofocus, simply tap where you want to focus and the white focus reticle will appear. And just like the level, it will also turn yellow and give you subtle haptic feedback when focus is achieved, which should be almost instantly. Now, if you leave your phone where it is, the reticle will remain there indefinitely, but if you start to move the phone around, it will disappear. If you don't tap to focus or when the reticle disappears, Halide will prioritize focus in the center of the frame. As long as you're not using an ultra wide lens, you can also focus manually. To activate manual focus, tap the AF icon here or swipe to bring out the manual focusing scale. Even when you're in manual focus, you can still tap on the screen to autofocus and the scale will adjust accordingly. Just swipe on the scale to adjust it. 0.0, .0 is the closest you can focus and 1.0 is the furthest away. You'll have noticed when I was swiping on the scale, this magnified view appeared to help me focus. This is called a focus loop and it turns on automatically when you adjust the focusing scale. If you don't want it on, you can tap the focus loop icon here to turn it off. Tap it again to turn it on permanently and again to set it back to automatic. Accompanying the focus loop is this icon, which is the focus peaking. Focus peaking highlights the areas of the scene that are in focus. The more prominent and strong the green, the sharper the focus. Tap the icon again to turn on automatic focus peaking and again to turn it off completely. Just be aware that Halide will default back to the automatic focus loop when you relaunch the app. Now, focus peaking can take some time to get used to. Just because something has green on it doesn't mean it's in sharp focus. It's definitely worth playing around with and getting used to which levels of green corresponds to which level of focus. So we're composed, we're focused. Now I want to set the white balance, which I can do by tapping the AWB icon here. AWB stands for Auto White Balance. Now, Halide doesn't offer grey card white balance at the moment, but I'm told it's a feature potentially in the works. For now, though, we have five presets. Auto, Cloudy, Daylight, Fluorescent, and Tungsten. If you forget which one is which, Halide offers a little prompt, which is cool. So obviously select the white balance which is best for you and just keep in mind that if you're shooting in hike or JPEG then your white balance will be baked in and if you're shooting in RAW 
then it won't be. Exposure. Now, I know this is the part that most people struggle with, especially when shooting in RAW. So I've included a lot of information and detail to help you use the exposure features and create the photos that you want. This little triangle here is telling me I'm in auto exposure or AE mode. This means that Halide is determining what it thinks is the correct exposure for me, wherever I point the phone. You can tell Halide exactly where you want to expose for by tapping the screen. You see the reticle lives a double life as both a focus and exposure reticle. If you want to adjust the exposure, simply swipe up and down anywhere on the viewfinder. And when you do that, this yellow line will appear with a value next to it. The value refers to brightness level. Swipe down to increase brightness and swipe up to increase brightness. Once you've stopped swiping, this line will fade away, but the exposure value, or EV, will remain up here to remind you how you've set it. With the exposure value set, you can still tap to focus and expose, but Halide will use the new exposure value as the base level exposure. To quickly reset your exposure value back to zero, if you're holding your phone in portrait mode, then you can quickly double tap it. There's no quick reset in landscape though. All that happens when you double tap the exposure value is the option to switch from auto to manual appears, which is the perfect segue into the manual controls. So like you've just seen, you can just tap the little triangle to switch to the manual controls. You can also swipe from the side of the screen, or you can use one of the shortcuts I demonstrated before to open Halide straight into manual mode. Once in manual mode, you can either tap ISO or shutter speed to bring up the switcher as well. To adjust the ISO and shutter speed, swipe across anywhere for ISO and swipe vertically for shutter speed. Very fast, very nice. The minimum and maximum ISO and shutter speed depends on which iPhone you use and which lens you're using. And to find out exactly what your phone is capable of, go into the settings and tap technical readout. And like auto exposure, the ISO and shutter speed sliders will disappear, but the values will remain up here, which I really like. Now, something to keep in mind is that if you tap to focus, your manual settings will reset, which can make Halide a bit counterproductive at times, because if you've got your settings locked and ready and you want to change or reconfirm your focus, you can't tap to use the autofocus. You have to do it manually. So it's a good idea to be familiar with the manual controls for when this happens. Now, a little bit of advice for you, and you can take it if you want. When you're shooting, keep the ISO as low as possible, and then just adjust the shutter speed until you see the exposure that you like. But when you're shooting in RAW, how do you know which shutter speed to use? Because what you see on the screen isn't what the RAW file often looks like. Well, I'll tell you in a second. First, I want to talk about the flash. <laughs> yes, the flash. Because believe it or not, you may actually want to use the flash in Halide. In auto mode, the flash is automatic. It does what it does. But in manual mode, its power output is based on which settings you've chosen. You see, if I'm taking a lovely portrait of this Pasiq and I want to fill in some of this shadow here, auto mode flash blinds the Pasiq and makes the Pasiq look like a demonic cat in headlights. But switch to manual mode, dial down the exposure, and you get a nice bit of fill flash instead. Onto exposure guides. Now these are my favorite part of Halide Mark II, and I know I go on and on about exposure guides, but they really are important and useful. But why? Well, when you're shooting in hike or JPEG, what you see on the viewfinder is the photo you're going to get, whether you're in auto exposure or manual. What you see is what you get. But as I quickly mentioned before, when you're shooting in RAW, what you see on the viewfinder isn't what you get because there's just too much information to process and display in real time. Thankfully then, Halide has four tools designed to help you optimize your exposure and colors. So no matter what's in front of you, no matter how bright or dim your phone screen is, you'll know what's really going on in your photo and there'll be no surprises. The first of these wonderful guides is the luminosity histogram, which lets you keep an eye on how bright your image is, where your highlights are, where your shadows are, etc. Tap this icon here to turn it on and it should appear in the corner so it's out of the way and you can focus on your composition. But if you want to really inspect it, just tap the icon again to make it front and center. Tap it again to turn it off. And in case you're unsure, blacks, shadows, midtones, highlights, whites. 
This means your image is shadow heavy. This means your image has lots of highlights. And be aware, just because your histogram is telling you your image is shadow heavy doesn't mean it's underexposed. Here, the dark footwell in the car is in a lot of the photo. So the histogram is reporting lots of shadows, but the majority of the image is exposed well. The luminosity histogram is probably my favorite exposure guide. I have it on like 95% of the time. And how I use it to get the exposure I want is I set the ISO as low as I can, preferably the lowest it will go. Then I'll adjust the shutter speed and watch the histogram. When the histogram looks like how I want it to, I'll take the photo. I like to shoot with it leaning slightly more towards the shadows. Next, we have the color histogram. To change the luminosity histogram to the color histogram, you can just tap it. Digital images are made up of varying levels of three colors, red, green, and blue, commonly known as RGB. And a color histogram tells you what's happening with each of them. This is useful if, for example, you're photographing something and you want to make sure certain colors aren't too bright or too dark. Now, it could be me, but Halide's colour histogram doesn't look like the other colour histograms that I'm used to. I'm just being 100% honest with you, I'm, I'm unsure how to interpret it and how to demonstrate it, so I'm going to move on to the waveform. Tap the colour histogram to bring up the colour waveform. Now, this looks like a huge mess, but it's actually really cool and not so hard to read. Now, as it's a colour waveform, it's splitting the scene into colours. Top equals bright and bottom equals dark. When the colour, or colours, bunch up at the top and form a line like this, it means they're too bright, they're losing information or clipping. Same at the bottom, too dark, losing information. What's really cool about waveforms is the length, the x-axis of the waveform corresponds with what you're seeing in the viewfinder. So you can see here, the left side is my colourful laptop screen. Here's my monitor's blank screen, and here's my lamp, which is clipping. This other small area of clipping is the lamp's reflection. Notice as well how when I change the setting, the waveform looks completely different. So why is that? It's because there's an 8-bit version and a 14-bit version. Now bear with me. When you're not adjusting the manual settings, Halide's exposure guides are based on an 8-bit preview of your photo. But as soon as you start to adjust the manual settings, they switch and become based on the full 14-bit RAW. Now this can be seen and understood most clearly with the zebras. Zebras are probably the easiest exposure guide to use because they appear automatically in your viewfinder and let you know where exactly in your photo you're clipping. The more prominent they are, then the more you're clipping. And they're multicolored because they're based on the RGB color channels. So if the zebras appear, you're not necessarily over or under exposed on the whole. It's just in a certain color or colors. I like to use the zebras in combination with the luminosity histogram. You can see here, zebras have appeared to let me know I'm clipping blue and red in this tree, but the luminosity histogram is telling me the overall exposure is good. When the zebras turn grey though, then you're over or underexposed and you might want to think about making an adjustment. If you're still struggling with this 8-bit and 14-bit stuff, then the best thing you can do, the absolute best thing, is shoot. Seriously, go out and try it for yourself over and over again. And I guarantee you, I promise you, that you will have that light bulb moment where you just get it. Now, if your iPhone has depth mode supported, I think it started from like the iPhone 7 and onwards, if that is the case, then Halide also supports depth mode as well. Tap this little box down here to turn it on, and depending on which device you have, certain things may happen. On all devices, RAW turns to max. On iPhones that have a telephoto lens, like my iPhone 12 Pro, it automatically switches to the telephoto lens, and it looks like your iPhone is sending out an EMP, which you can turn off by tapping the word portrait. And you get this little icon that, when tapped, makes you feel like you've entered the grey tricks. These two visualizations add nothing to the quality of the final result, and I just ignore them. Finally, on phones with multiple lenses, auto white balance greys out and you lose access to the manual controls and the manual focus. 
But on phones like the iPhone XR though, that have a single lens and calculate depth differently, you don't get these visualizations. But you can still access the manual controls, the white balance and the manual focus, which is nice. The front facing camera is a different story. If you have a phone with a notch, then you have a true depth camera system and can use depth mode from the front facing camera. Here, regardless of which device you have, access to the white balance, the manual settings, all returns, which is nice. And that is the photographic process over. So once you've captured something, you can tap down here to enter Halide's reviewer and view your photos. This is Halide's main reviewer screen and it offers numerous different features. This is the grid view where you can view your photos as a grid and quickly select the one you want. There's not much you can do here. You can't batch select your photos, for example, but there is this image rescue option that rescues your images when they fail to save. Now, I've honestly never had to use this feature, so I can't comment on whether or not it works. Let's go back to our photo. And if you're holding the phone in portrait, you can see down here exactly which type of file you've shot in. So this is a RAW and this is a JPEG. You've also got some date and time information here. And if you enabled location, you'll have the place it was taken. These are the settings it was shot at and you can swipe up to see more settings, which can be really useful. You can favorite a photo and it'll automatically be added to your favorites album in the photos app. You can delete unwanted photos and you can share or send your keepers somewhere. Just be aware that if you shot in RAW and you save the RAW file to your camera roll, it'll convert to a JPEG. But if you save your RAW to the files app, it'll save the DNG. Now, if you're a RAW shooter and you have a more recent device, then you'll also have this instant RAW feature, which applies some natural looking and basic edits to your RAW files. It's never going to rescue a completely under or overexposed image, and it's not going to recreate that banger you've seen on Instagram. It's just going to make your RAW files look a bit better. And it's designed for those who want to shoot in RAW, but aren't yet confident with editing. So if you're learning photography, focus mainly on getting the settings right, and then you can use Instant RAW to give you an idea of what you could do with the file. And finally on Instant Raw, it's not like a jumping off platform where Instant Raw will start your edit off and you can export the DNG and carry on elsewhere. Your Instant Raw photos will export from Halide as processed images with the edits baked in. And again, it's not available on all devices. If you are interested in editing though, and you do edit your photos after the fact, then something else that won't be on all devices, but could be, is the option to open your files directly into Darkroom or Raw Power. Once you install either of them, the option to open your photo there will automatically appear here. And if like some crazy person, you have both of them, then you can tap and hold to select which one you'd prefer. One final nice touch is that when you're in Raw Power or Darkroom, you can also quickly jump back into Halide. I'm loving the collaborative synergy here. Finally, depth mode photos also let you view the depth map. And if your portrait is of a human, then you can also review the portrait effects map. This is cool, but ultimately completely useless. Something else that was cool, but again, ultimately useless though, is the AR functionality that the original Halide used to have, but is gone from Halide Mark II. It was this really cool thing where you could visualize your depth mode photo in 3D and you could do nothing with it apart from just like show off a little bit, but it was cool and I hope they bring it back. Speaking of being completely useless, uh, I sincerely hope that this tutorial wasn't completely useless because it's come to an end. I finished, that's it. That's all I have to say about Halide Mark II. So I'm bound to have missed something or forgotten something or got something wrong. So if that's the case, then feel free, like I said, to leave a comment. Let me know if you enjoyed the tutorial and let me know if you absolutely hated the tutorial. I mean, this is my first ever proper tutorial or user guide. So it may be, it just may be the worst tutorial in the history of cognition. I do love the fact that you've watched this tutorial though. I love the fact that you've clicked on it because it shows that, that you want to learn, that you want to improve, that, that you care about, like when you go to bed, you want to be a better person than the one you were when you woke up. So good on you, seriously, good on you. The world needs more people like you. Thank you so much for watching. Aussie Buna.